What's up, strongest men, women, and children from blocks all around the world? I am my block's strongest man, here with my esteemed co-host, Isaac from Hunger Smash Fitness. What's up, Isaac? And we're here once again on a Monday evening with some spectacular guests, one of whom is here already, Jonathan Cotton. Hey, Jonathan, thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, good to be with you guys. Yeah, you've uh, you've just done two very exciting shows. Uh, Travis Ortmeyer was there with you, your teammate on one of them, the World's Strongest Team, and Travis will be joining us very soon as well for those in the audience. But uh, we do have some Colorado boys in the audience, specifically Justin Manning. So uh, he's been looking forward to talking with you, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. What's up, Justin? Justin's a good friend of the show. Awesome. So we like to get started by kind of talking about Isaac and I go real quick through what we've been working on this week, and then we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the uh, discussion. So Isaac, you got anything uh, coming up that you've been working on? World Open, Deadlift Championships, uh, even if you haven't put anything together as of yet, because I know you're waiting to have all of the final information. What do you have in mind? What do you think is going to happen? Um, well, I am working on getting my predictions together for the World Deadlift Championship. I need to I need to post that video sometime soon. I just haven't done it yet. Um, do you want me to actually discuss how I think it's going to happen here, or yeah, let's do or, it. Well, well, how about how about you retain a little bit, but give us a little taste. Okay. Well, I will tell you that I was um, I was counting on Asco winning it, setting the record, but then he pulled out because he has an injury. Um, so I'm going to have to rework my predictions just a little bit now. Um, well, let me see. Should we actually go through it at all? Or uh, there's let's there's just, a couple. Let's just, uh, let's just leave it as, do you think anyone else can pull it now that ass goes out? Um, with what I've been seeing currently, no. I don't okay. think any of the other guys really have much of a shot. Um, Asco was the only one that I, I felt fairly confident in saying that he that he had a he had the best shot. We'll put it that way. Um, I think Payman or Pyman, however you say his name, um, he has potential, but I don't quite see him getting it as of now. Uh, maybe in another year or so. But yeah, outside of that, I'm not really seeing any of the guys breaking the 500 uh, level. Yeah, and Jonathan, I want to get your opinion on this too, uh, if it's all right with you. So when we have guests on, we typically talk about all the accomplishments they've gone through lately, but also kind of what's uh, contemporary in the sport of strongman and kind of pick your brain because, you know, you're a thousand times more experienced than I am at this. And so uh, what do you think about the World Deadlift Championships? First of all, do you agree with us that Asko was the front runner? And uh, now that he's out, do you have an opinion on what will happen? Yeah, I think uh, – th I think. Uh, uh, He's Karu the deadlifter, right on uh, Instagram. Um, yep, yep. He he looked from his training, and then and then uh, Pavlo, I think it's Navachenko or something. I'm probably butchering that, but um, uh, both of those guys looked pretty good. I would say probably probably Karu was the front front runner, and uh, Pavlo may have had a good shot at at uh, you know high, high fours, maybe like for, you know four eighty five something like that. Um, from what I've seen from uh, uh, Makarov. He in his uh, triple ply suit, he looks pretty good. He's gotten close to 500 several times, but in recent months, um, I haven't seen any attempts really anywhere close to that. So I'm not sure where he's at as far as uh, his current max ability. So uh, yeah, I think I tend to agree with you guys. I think um, we'll probably see some good numbers, maybe a maybe a 480 or something. But I, d I doubt we'll see anybody break um, 501. Yeah, I think uh, the weights that they're doing, 475 is the next step down from the 505. So it, it seems like oh, yeah. going right, right from 475 to 505. I think uh, Makarov and uh, Pavlo will do 475. But I don't think anybody's yeah. hitting 505 now. I agree. I think I think you're right on that, yeah. It'll be interesting to see some of these guys that were going to do the deadlift only are now going to be in the full contest. And some of them we haven't seen before in Giants Live. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I think yeah, Makarov I is one of them. Yeah, I think that's really exciting seeing some of these guys doing the full comp. Um, I was going to say too, Rhino, I think, or Rauno, or however you say his name, um, I think he has a decent shot at getting the 475, but he's kind of seemed off of his game lately too. So I'm not sure if he's, maybe he's not showing his best or, or what have you. But um, if, if he's coming in in shape, I think he can definitely. I think the 475 is is achievable for him, attainable for him. I don't see him getting the the 505 though. 
And then, uh, just so everyone's aware, we have our other guest, Travis Ortmeyer, who I will bring in to the uh, telecast. What's up, Travis? We're talking What's Denver up? World Championships. How you guys doing? Good. How you doing? Doing well. Just got home from a workout, so. Well, Just thanks for joining us, man. Seems like we're always uh, grabbing you when you're uh, when you're busy with something. Thanks for joining. We really appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible. I don't feel like I'm very busy in normal life. So, <laughs> only no, on the road and getting to see national parks and go to saunas and jump in cold rivers and shit like that. <laughs> Sounds yeah. great. Sounds great to me, man. <laughs> what was up with uh, with all the golfing? That looked like a ton of fun. Was that part of the competition, or was that you know, something afterwards? That's just something we did before the day before uh, Portugal. I guess the yeah. the promoter he lives on that golf course. So, oh wow, yeah, we were just kind of hanging out and got to have some fun, hit some balls, and I didn't know I could swing a club. <laughs> You didn't have a contest to see who could hit it the furthest or anything like that? Or who I don't think we had an official one. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure we had, you know, everybody was watching who was the best. <laughs> we were just working on making contact with the ball mostly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, my problem is whenever I go, you know, to the putting range or anything like that, I'm 6'5", and so, and I'm left-handed. And so, none of the clubs that they have there fit me at all. And so I need to, I need to try and find a couple that I can start bringing with me that actually, I don't have to do a half squat just to actually hit the ball. <laughs> <laughs> just use a driver for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's cool to see all the, uh, the nature based stuff you do, Travis. It's really uh, inspiring. I, I go into the woods myself. Uh, Isaac was just asking me, what I've been up to this weekend. Isaac, what if I show a little bit of my Instagram? What do you think of that? Yeah, I'd say go for it. You've, you've had <laughs> a couple of interesting... Here. Yeah, a couple of interesting... Uh, uh, and thrown over a, a makeshift bar out in the woods. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, there it is. How heavy was that? No idea. 170 kilos. <laughs> I mean, you pressed it overhead like it was nothing. <laughs> it's nice work, man. There you go. Here comes the big one. <laughs> I love how rudimentary this platform is that you've got going. You can train strongman anywhere if you're willing to just look around and find stuff to train with, apparently. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Strongman is everywhere. And, oh, oh, oh look at that. <laughs> In fact, that's, that's actually why I got my pickup truck that I have. Because... Uh, Half of my original equipment was shit that I found in a parking lot or on the side of the freeway or, you know, construction sites. <laughs> you become a pretty good uh, scavenger, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, and I just got to point out who the first uh, comment on there congratulating me was. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> What's that? I said I just got to point out who the first comment on that reel was congratulating me on that lift. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I got to get one of those industrial scales, bring it out, and then I can tell you what those stones weigh. You know what? Yeah, strong man. Half of that shit's made up anyway. Just kind of <laughs> yeah. take a guess, dude. <laughs> I'll, I'll just bring a paintbrush out there and write the number I want it to be. How about that? There you That's go. Exactly it. <laughs> whatever, uh, whatever, whatever Isaac can lift plus one. It's, it's yeah. one of those incredibly dense meteorites that <laughs> fell from fell to earth. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, so before we get too far through, uh, we are sponsored this evening, so I have to share um, any of the events that some of you folks have seen me cover, uh, statistics, analytics-wise, that you really love and want to know who are the people putting on these events. It's the great guys at Garage Gym Life Media who have been so kind as to sponsor this live stream this evening. So go ahead and check them out. We'll let John, the founder of Garage Gym Life Media, tell you a little more. 
At a home gym, especially if you're training by yourself, can be tough because sometimes you just don't have the motivation to go in your garage or your basement and get it done. And that's why we stream competitions every month on the Garage Gym Life Media YouTube channel. I'm John Grease, the third founder of Garage Gym Life Media. And after 20 years of training in a home gym, I can tell you that there are some days when I just don't feel like training. And those are the days when I put on some sort of training video or other strength related content to give me the extra motivation I need to get in there and get it done. There is nothing more motivating than seeing people achieving their goals at a powerlifting meet or a strongman competition. And that's why month after month, we provide that content to you right there in the comfort of your own home on our YouTube channel. Plus, we leave it up forever so you can always just throw it on in the background anytime you need that extra dose of motivation to get you going. And that's why if you're not already a subscriber to Garage Online Media, I invite you to take advantage of this opportunity to add this powerful training tool into your arsenal because I want you to succeed right there in the best gym in town. And we once again thank our friends at Garage Gym Life Media for sponsoring this live stream. Much appreciated. So for anybody watching, if you like what you've heard so far, uh, please go ahead and like this stream, subscribe, and then when we're all done, make a little note on your sticky notes for yourself to go over to Hunger Smash Fitness and subscribe there as well. Um, so why don't we get right into it? So Travis, Jonathan, how did you first get involved with uh, Strongman Champions League? It's a it's a 16 stage set of uh, contests as far as I'm aware per year, right? And this was part eight and nine or seven and eight that you guys were competing in? I think that's right. Yeah, I think it was, we're kind of in the middle of this season uh, has been a little weird. Last season was weird. I uh, think, think we're all aware of the extenuating circumstances, but um, typically, yeah, I think it's uh, 16, 16 that they do. One of those being, uh, I believe, uh, 105 kg and 90 kg world championships. Interesting. And so, uh, were you guys training together a lot before this, or was this sort of a first meeting, or how did uh, explain that a bit? I, I've met his brother once. That's as close as I've gotten to him. <laughs> and yeah. More times than I've met his brother. Yeah. 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 It must have been a, a good impression if you agreed to to go and compete with him. That's what I said. If, if he's anything like his brother, his brother's strong as fuck. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he's anything like his brother, we'll be all right. And yeah, he proved he, he didn't disappoint. He's definitely got strength and a strong will. So, you know, that's all that's all you need in strong man. You, you can go a long way with those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I had seen a few of the other competitors that I knew were going to be there, and I saw them training together with some of the implements. So I had a little bit of an idea what we were going to be facing, but it just wasn't feasible given the time frame for us to really get together and train. So you know, I think in the future, if we were going to do it again, hopefully we'd get a chance to at least get one session in because some of the events, our first time trying them together was when the whistle blew, which is yeah, not ideal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One, one training session would have gone a long way. I think that yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the implements really required coordination. Like there was one where it was the way I would describe it is both of you were doing like a Zercher lift, but it wasn't yeah. a fixed bar. So you had to balance it. Mm -hmm. That, that maybe would have benefited from a uh, training session. Yeah. If we, if we, you know, we pick it up just right and take the same first step, then it's okay. But if you take an opposite, opposite first step or, one person starts a little faster than the other, it, it starts to really get off balance really quick because it's just hanging on one piece. And that machine, I think Ilka said it weighed 450 kilos. So it's 990. Yeah. And that's not counting the bar. So that's a thousand pound machine that we're holding. Yeah, once that thing starts swaying, it, it got real off center real quick. <laughs> So, yeah, Jeez, yeah. Good, good, good memories. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I remember most of it. I was halfway blacked out, but hey. You took a lot of steps for being blacked out. I'll definitely, I'll say that. Yeah, thankfully, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another well, thing. You know, it just right. one training session to kind of learn where to put that bar mm -hmm. would have made a huge difference because we had fast feet. We would have had a good time. You know, so just that one, one little practice, and then you can you can train it on your own after that. But that one practice to get the timing down and to figure out high, right. low, what's what's right for for me, right? And then, uh, yeah, because our our foot speed was was fantastic on that one. I think 
you know, we would have definitely been in the money points wise on that. But, you know, some of the other events, there was like real tight spacing within two or three seconds. And we just seemed to luck just rolled not our way on all of those. We kind of finished at the back of a two second split between five, six teams. You know, it's <laughs> like yeah. the front hold. If we'd have gone, he could have held another five seconds, but didn't know that the uh, the ref was calling my time and not his time. And, you know, an extra three seconds would have given us like four places or five places. Oh, in the front hold. Yeah, yeah. That was a – So, was a- yeah. I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's, that's one of those things I think we got – we had to go first on that one, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. And you never want to go first on a front hold. But, you know, we got stuck in that cycle of going early. And so all the other teams got to see whatever mistakes we were making and correct themselves. <clears throat> I will say, though, that the implements that they chose uh, looked fantastic. Oh, yeah. Can I say, Those can I say coolest awesome. front hold ever? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you've seen the pickaxe, you've seen you know, all this other stuff, but like giant shiny padlocks. Now that's a new one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the equipment here, I mean, he did a really good job on the equipment. You know, the super yoke with the girls on either side, the, uh, the front hold locks, the two man log, and then just the creativity that they used for that Forrester machine. You know, one guy being on a pulley and the other guy doing straight weight. That was uh, that was something else. Yeah, I was hoping you guys could talk a little bit more about that because watching it on the video, like, it just looks um, confusing. Because, I mean, because Travis takes off and is blasting out of there and John's hardly moving. So, I mean, maybe, John, maybe from your point of view, too, maybe talk about the mental, uh, mental game that that's playing with you, seeing – Travis just disappearing into the distance and you're you're hardly moving with that. Um, yeah, yeah. So this um this particular machine uh I, I do it's used for logging or something. It's a, I, there's a, there's a John Deere plant in in Uensu and I think uh, they were one of the contest sponsors which is which is why they used it. But they have used this machine um two in the two years previous for the SCL Finland stage, just the normal stage, not a team competition. Uh, the first year they used it, I think they, nobody even, maybe one person got it like a meter. So it was, you know, everybody was getting kind of uh, a meter and centimeters for their distance. Nobody had finished the course. And that was just the traditional uh, harness hooked up to the, hooked up to the machine. And so then the second year they did it, they, they used a, they attached a pulley to the machine and then had a rope attached to the same attachment point where you're pulling from. And then it comes around and loops and attaches to your harness. So as you're pulling, you're kind of pulling against the pulley and then and then the the rope is moving like this as the truck slowly moves forward if that makes sense so you're going the same distance yourself but the truck or the machine is only going to go half the distance so what they did for this one was kind of combine those two concepts in a two to make it a uh, um capable of a, a two-person pull so it's kind, of, kind of a weird i've never seen that before either i've seen uh contests in the past where they have two guys hooked up to a truck but but having the one on a pulley um, and like you said, mentally it was like, you know, I was aware that he was going to be taking off faster, but it was hard to gauge like how fast I was going. Cause again, like, you know, obviously you can't practice that type of event really, but if I had practiced it, I would have known like, okay, by the time he reaches this point, I should be, you know, it just, I don't know. It would have made it a little easier, but I basically thought, you know what, I'm just going to put my head down and, and, and pull until I, uh, you know, <laughs> until I feel the thing stop moving because he was the one who was going to reach the finish line and trigger the whistle. So my job was basically just, you know, add whatever extra I could uh, to to what he was pulling, basically, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So so just pull till the whistle blows, basically. Exactly. Yeah, kind, kind of, of like football, football, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they had to get creative. That thing was so nasty to pull. I mean, first off, you got those off-road tires that don't want to move, and then you have eight wheels. And then whatever kind of gearbox that thing has for whatever kind of engine it has, so it can pull logs off the side of a mountain. So, yeah, yeah the the pulley system is what made it possible. I don't know if we'd have been able to pull it fifty feet just straight 
two of us pulling. You know, it yeah. was it was a nasty. It was only something like eighteen tons or something like it was like you know thirty five thousand pounds, which is heavy in its own right, or forty thousand pounds, eighteen metric tons. So that's heavy in its own right, but it's not that heavy for two men. That would be a sprint for two men. So that thing it fought you. It was like it was like the guy had it in reverse. <laughs> you, know, and you had to fight that pull the whole freaking way. It didn't feel one that thing way. about the pulley is it was a you know a regular one inch nylon rope, so there was a whole lot of spring and give to that anchor, and you know being I set up too far off to the side, so I had this angle that when I started it wanted to pull me to the side and like take me off balance, which is why you know for a first three to four maybe five seconds it. I didn't feel like I was pulling worth a shit because I was trying to figure out the, the mechanism and then and try to stay low because it kept pulling me backwards every time I did a step. So once you could see it after the start, after, you know, five seconds in, I really get down and I'm, you know, I'm at the angle that Jonathan's at pulling, you know, he's got it figured out because he's got the regular pull. And then finally, you know, my brain wraps itself around it and, uh, we end up with a really strong finish, but I feel like if I'd have gotten my feet under me faster, because again, that was one of those two to three second things. If I'd have gotten my feet under me faster, we would have won that event hands down. So a little bit frustrating there. <laughs> and that just kind of sums up the whole contest, like one minor little change and we could have won the damn event, but yeah. <laughs> that event was one. I, um, I can't remember if one of us posted the, the score sheet after that. I tried to remember to take pictures, but but the score, I believe the times were all in the uh, 30s for seconds. And and it was like, there was even a few times that were down to a hundredth of a second. And there, there was about five times grouped in that group. And we were the last of those. So we were like, you know, we were like 31 and change. And then there was someone who was 31 and then someone who was 30 and change. And, and it just, you know, that, that, that kind of time difference is a few extra steps, uh, one missed, one missed uh, grab on the rope and, and it can cause. So it, it's a little frustrating to finish that way and know that, man, if I could have just, you know, <laughs> but that's the nature of the game in strongman. There's no, uh, you know, no complaints about that. It's just, it's just hard to feel the frustration from that sometimes. Yeah. We ended up, uh, oh crap. I don't have the placing on it. That, that yeah. had us in fourth place overall, but uh, I don't have the times. Sorry. never mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to forgot to think about it. Yeah, I was trying to take as many pictures as I could, but yeah. I was gonna say you guys are talking about kind of being a little bit on the wrong end of certain things, but then uh then the sandbag toss came to play and that pattern did not continue. Yeah. <laughs> we did that one right. We did that one right. There was what nine bags, there was four black bags and five Cerberus red bags. And Cerberus have a shorter strap. The black bags had this longer strap, totally different pull. So the teams that try to jump from one color to the next with the same guy usually ended up screwing up one of those throws because they were trying to do it the same way. Now, if you watch in the video, my pull is a lot longer. It's a lot more swing. <clears throat> and then, see, you really got to get the timing of that bag down because it's like six inches longer. <clears throat> so as soon as... You know, I finish the four, I tag in Jonathan, and you see those straps are a different length. So he was just in the warm-ups, he practiced those, and I practiced the black bags, and we just kind of went for broke. Like, look, you're going to get all of yours, I'm going to get all of mine, and that's just how it's going to work. And, you know, the gamble paid off. He, he nailed that last one. And, uh, yeah, I think a couple teams – their pace was a little bit faster, like especially Danis and Ivar's, but they missed one. So they ended up a couple seconds after us. And, you know, that again, Ivar's, I think it was, went with four of the black bags and one red bag. And as soon as he went with that red bag, it screwed it up. So, well, and then, I mean, I love the celebration at the end as well. That's definitely, you know, you know, that was the highlight of the video there. <laughs> so, um, and to, get, to give a little background on the contest, too, because I know um, 
before I competed in Strongman Champions League, I wasn't really aware very much of the contests they did and everything. And uh, and I, I think um, just because a lot of the Strongman audience is UK and US based, um, at least you know the YouTube and TV audience. Uh, I don't I don't think SEL gets as much coverage, but um, there was actually there was pretty stacked contest. I think there were four or five former world's strongest man competitors in the in the in the various teams. So it wasn't like you know a lot, a lot of the teams people may not have heard of because these guys compete primarily in Europe. Um, and there's some crossover with the giant shows, but a lot of them aren't really doing any U.S. shows. Um, so uh, so it was pretty stacked competition. And 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 I just bring this up because Travis mentioned uh, Ivars and Danis. Both of them have been to, to World's Strongest Man uh, uh, multiple times. And these guys, when we came in, I mean, I've competed against both, both of them before, and Travis has competed with them many times. They were the threat, definitely uh, the, the uh, I would say, the favorites for, for winners. I mean, they're both, like I said, they sometimes get looked over. You know, a lot of times Ivars will be on the uh, World's world's Strongest Man list, and people kind of look over him because they don't see as much footage. But uh, these guys are beasts. And uh, Yeah, Ivars made the final last year. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I had seen uh, both of them throw before, and specifically Danis is uh, very explosive. And uh, so I was, I was thinking, like you know, after we, I believe they went after us, and and I was thinking, you know, our time was pretty good, but but they might, they might, uh, they might blow it out of the water. But the trick with throwing events is you want to be smooth and you want to make zero mistakes. If you go real fast and make a mistake, it doesn't matter how fast you went. Now you're because that little mistake and an extra throw adds on so many seconds that all the other guys are going to, you know what I mean? So it's, it's one of those kind of tricky events where you really have to be, you can't go totally all out, but you have to go <laughs> as fast as possible while remaining smooth and keeping your form. Um, but uh, yeah, when our, when our way the we had kind of messed around, like Travis said, with the bags, uh, we got to practice a little bit. And that one, the, they were, uh, I believe it was 22, 24, 26, 28, which that comes out to like 50, uh, roughly maybe like 50, 55, 60. 28 uh, would be a little over 60. Yeah. Two or something. And then the last one was 32, which is uh, 70.5. 70. Yeah. That I had never really, I haven't really trained with bags that heavy, but when we were practicing, I thought, you know what, let me just give it a shot. And it went over. So I thought, okay, I know this is possible, you know? And uh, so our, we kind of went in with the strategies. Travis has got longer arms and he's got more throwing experience than I do. So we said, okay, you take the more difficult ones, the ones with the, with the longer straps, like you saw him do. And then I'll take the four corresponding Cerberus bags. And then depending how I feel, if I, if I pick up the other one, it doesn't feel good. Or if I go for a throw and miss it, I'm not going to waste time throwing and throwing and throwing. Cause with you guys have probably seen, but with explosive strength, it, it falls off very quickly. So a lot yeah. of times you'll see a throwing event, like a world's strongest man and the guy will get up there and he'll miss and he'll miss the second time. You pretty much know it's over. The guy wants to keep trying, but you, you can kind of tell the explosive strength just falls off so quick. So I was getting ready to tag him, but I picked it up and thought, well, you know, this feels pretty good. So I just went for it and boom, <laughs> went over. So I, I was almost like a little surprised too. So I think that's some of you saw, some of what you saw in the celebration was like, oh shit, wow, we really, uh, <laughs> you know, really ended up killing that event. So it was a, <laughs> a nice feeling after having some, like like we mentioned earlier, after having some uh, unfortunate finishes. How high was the bar? Uh, 4.3 meters, which is like 14, just barely over 14, I think, 14 feet. I can't imagine throwing a 70 pound weight that high. Kudos to you guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, like a small adult, basically, you know, throwing them up, up to a second story. So it's kind of <laughs> that's crazy. Because, yeah. <laughs> uh, John, you work as a nurse, right? So, so do you brag yeah, about yeah. that to your, to your patients that you're like, well, I, I hurl 70 pound bags over 15 foot bars or whatever? <laughs> <It's> only <laughs> if you're unruly. Yeah. 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 Don't mess with me. We got, you know. Oh, that's no, sometimes. <laughs> I'll have a heavier patient that, uh, you know, an elderly patient or something that can't be, can't move themselves and they'll have to move up in bed and they'll say, oh, we need to call the lift team. And I'm like, what, they only weigh, you know, 100 kilos or something. I, I, I am the lift team. I am the lift team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, don't waste your time and take a lunch break or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, so, uh, yeah. Tra Travis, a question for you. Brother Mister wants to know, uh, how was it having Oberus stay with you for a few weeks before Worlds? <laughs> Oh, Oberst. Oberst is a good guy. He's a uh, he's a good training partner. He's a lot of fun, and uh, you know we did a lot of his YouTube thing, which is always fun, like a, the sushi eating challenge. <laughs> but yeah, Oberst is a good dude, so we had a good time. 
Yeah, I saw that one. That was a fun one. Had you met Overs before that time? Or I don't remember yeah. if you guys ever competed together or anything. Yeah, I met him when he was still an amateur rookie. Mm. And then we were we did a uh, pilot for a reality show back in 2012. And the show fell through because our contact with A&E was also the same guy who worked with Duck Dynasty. And that's when the Duck Dynasty guy said all the crap about gay people and it kind of ruined – that whole connection. So the show never came out, but you know, Oberst was a part of that. And uh, you know, maybe he'll, he'll hit me back with the favor on uh, you know, the history strongest men. Yeah. Just out there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've known him for years. I hadn't seen him since then until I want to say it was like 2018, 2017. He and Kale Beck drove through here and, you know, we reconnected, hung out, and then he's come back through. He's got family about a half hour outside of Reno. So anytime he visits them, we train together. Was his head the same size back then, or has it gotten bigger as time goes by? I, you know what? I think he's always had a really big head. But his haircut doesn't help. It was shaved then. It's not shaved now. And his hair just kind of grows <laughs> yeah, I I got to. He showed up at one of the competitions I did a little bit ago, or I, that I helped out at. And um, first thing, like when he when he walked up, I was like, you know, he's a big dude, but that is a massive head. <laughs> like that's yeah. the first thing you notice about yeah, him. He's, he's got a thick skull. <laughs> I, I used yeah. to think Isaac was big until I saw that photo. <laughs> <laughs> But Hang Jonathan, on a minute, guys. I'm gonna, uh, I think I gotta let my dog out. Y'all have y'all take care for a minute. Yeah, man. Well, uh, so Jonathan Justin says he's seen you throw a keg about thirty feet in the air. <laughs> had to call NASA to let him know it's not a UFO. I do love uh, throwing events. That's one of one of my favorites. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Jonathan, what do you do on October second? I think I'm gonna join uh, Justin and trying to convince you to go do Tournament of the Titans too. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of, I was kind of on the fence, uh, dealing with a little bit. Of, oh, there's a dog. Hey, buddy. <laughs> He's joined in our little, uh, interview here. Um, yeah, I've got to see. I got a little bit of a back injury I'm dealing with, um, and then uh, I got to see what other contest plans I have. But I would love to do that one. Um, United States Strongman is kind of starting a pro uh, category. Which is an interesting topic. Uh, the European guys and stuff. When I talk to them, none of them really have a concept of pro or amateur strongman. It's kind of just you. You just start competing, and if you do well enough, you go to the next contest and the next one. And there's no real pro cards. It's kind of a specific specific to the U.S. It sounds like. But I guess uh, USS is going to try try to kind of differentiate it. I believe they're doing it because they want to. I believe what I read in their announcement, they wanted to create like a almost like a few pro athletes that they kind of help out and sponsor to get to the contest. Um, yeah. So if you want to gonna... learn anything more about that, yeah. Billy Wessels broke the news on my channel. So you can go and take a look <laughs> oh, through, yeah, yeah. Through, through my, through my older lives. Well, not older lives. It was a few weeks ago, actually, whenever, whenever yeah. the US, right before USS nationals. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. That's yeah, actually it was like episode 15, 16, something like that. I think is when yeah, we had them on. It. Five weeks ago or something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've um, talked to Billy a few times. That that was actually uh, what you had asked at the be beginning of the show, but that um, that was actually how I kind of got into SCL. I was competing with USS and went to their nationals in uh, 2018 and won the 275 division, the heavyweight division. And my brother took a very close second. It was like a point and a half. We, I think, and the points were like, it was like a hundred something. So it was like 109 and 108.5 or what? It was super close. So you, typically they send just the winner over to the SCL finish open. But I guess because we were brothers and we kind of finished close, they sent both of us over. And that was kind of our how we kind of broke into uh, uh, with Champions League. I hope you hold that over his head every chance you get. Yeah, because I have not been able to beat my brother. I don't know if you've seen any of his training or stuff, but he's uh, he's uh, another sure. level with his over, overhead press specifically. Like I, I believe he did a, a – 200 kilo Viper, I think, or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, um, his press has gotten really strong. Yeah, that's so I can't I can't really hang with him on that. It used to be I could beat him at the cardio events, but uh, 
but now he's even started to prove with that. So I got to really hang on to that Nationals win. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. We gotta have a Viper World Championships. Uh, yeah. Tyler, Tyler Cotton and Wes Claiborne go at it. Yeah, man, Wes has had a couple over four hundred too that I've seen. He's another one who's just unbelievable pressing. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. got that down. Yeah, I was gonna say too when you guys were talking about uh, um, the the Deadlift World Championships. One guy you got to watch out for. Uh, I've gotten to see him compete a few times. I've met, met him a few times, but uh, Gabe Pena. I don't. I don't know. Uh, base, his deadlift is is ridiculous. I don't know if he's really um, peaked himself for a five hundred yet, but he's doing the whole contest now, and um, he's really one to watch out for. He kind of had an unfortunate first first bout at Worlds. Uh, he had some medical issues, so he wasn't able to really showcase. But um, I think he's. A lot of people are going to be talking to him after after Saturday. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, Gabe, <laughs> Gabe, Gabe actually was uh, kind enough to give me an interview on my channel. Great guy. We had a great interview, and his deadlift is uh, is incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I feel some sort of way about him not being allowed to compete at Worlds this year, but maybe we'll leave that for another time. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, the politics of Worlds are, yeah. Travis has talked about that. We we actually had a lot of downtime to talk when you share a room. It is a tiny room too. I put I posted a picture on my. Uh, I mean, he's so much like, room between the beds. <laughs> yeah, it was side by side uh, twin beds. Yeah, yeah. What is this uh, strongman champions league Tokyo? <laughs> <laughs> they were better than cardboard. They were better than cardboard. But yeah, so the, uh, Finnish, the Finnish people are very you know they're kind of minimalistic. So the the hotel room was very uh, you know. Function over form, I would say, but uh, it was it was nice. It was nice though, but uh, definitely not the space I might be used to. Yeah, <laughs> not built for large people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, a lot of Europe is that way. You know, even in Portugal, I had my own room and my own bed, but it was still two twin mattresses stuck together. Like I found myself kind of falling between them and split, spreading the beds out overnight, like. Come on, you know, give me a big fat king size mattress. Where the hell are those? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they just don't do that much in Europe. <laughs> you guys have air conditioning at least? What's that? Yeah, the one in, in Portugal did. Finland right. did not. Really? Finland, the room was hot as shit. Even when it was cold, as, it was really cold outside. Like the last two days we were there and it was kind of rainy. And I, we would wear jackets outside. We'd get in the room and it was like 90 degrees. We had two fans going. I don't know how they kept it so hot. It's like we were over the top of the kitchen or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean, yeah, that like speaking of uh, European customs, like I love my family in Italy, but none of them use air conditioning. Like I go there in the summer and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can get warm in Italy. Yeah. Which part? They're all over. So I have a cousin in Rome. I have cousins up in Ravenna, which is uh, like an hour south of uh, Venice, Venezia. Uh, okay. I have uh, family in the south in the Avellino region. So all around. Yeah, the, the I, I know the south and I know Rome. It, it gets hot. It gets real hot during the summer. Yeah, screw that. No air conditioning. No, no it's, it's too hot for that shit. They, they yeah. literally just opened the window. I'm like, but it's hot out there too. Like, right. like that's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, enough about me. Let's talk some more about the events because that wheelbarrow thing was crazy. Let's. Uh, that's the coolest looking. Like I'm going to say about every event at SCL Finland. That's the coolest looking wheelbarrow uh, race I've ever seen. Yeah, I'm not sure what that machine on there was. It was some kind of shredding, wood shredding machine. It had two big spinning blades on the top, and then it was all engine. I think it was something like uh, 770 in the hands, 350 kilos in the hands. Yeah, that's. I think that's what they told us, yeah. <clears throat> kind of a, a cool event. We had to push it slightly uphill. <laughs> yeah. yeah and that if was you... one, I was going to be worried about that one for my hamstring, but – yeah, I just leaned forward and used the toes, and it was all quads. They just kind of pushed off. But with that wide base, it was easy to steer, so you could really kind of just lean into it. Yeah, I don't know what that machine was. It was big. And you can see I had a little uh, hiccup there, and Travis is just screaming at me to to get it. So it really helped, actually, having, having someone like Travis there. I kind of made a dive over the finish line. Like, I'm going to make this run as fast as I can because I'm not going to, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think Travis was just describing a big machine. I thought he was describing himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the we oh, yeah, know is, is one of my best events. It's one that I've always been fortunate enough to have really fast feet and a good good sense of direction, I guess, on. The, the mistake with this, you can see Travis finished, uh, he took off like a rocket. And he was kind of explaining it to me afterward. Again, it was a, kind of our first time uh, um, touching these implements. But I kind of carried it. I picked and carried a little more like a frame carry, like kind of a straight up pick and then walked walking straight. Whereas Travis, like he was saying, kind of picked it up with a, already with a forward lean and, and got up on his toes. That way you're letting the kind of the, the machine pull itself forward and you're just kind of keeping up. And so I think if I had adjusted a little bit, I might have been able to go you know, a little faster. We, we still had a pretty decent time because a lot of guys struggled with that. But we could have had, a, I think, maybe a top time with, with a little tweak in, uh, in form on that. But, hey, you know. Because yeah, what they did, they took both of our times and added them together. That was our score. Yeah. And that's how they did a lot of those events. They did the uh, – Front hold. What was that? Front hold. We added the times together. Um, the yoke frame, I think, was just one time. They didn't do a split or anything. And I think the same was true with the uh, – uh, what was the other event with the two parts? Oh, no, they didn't need a split because it was a two-man carry. So that was just one time. Yeah, I think it was just the front hold and then this one. They just added them together. Yeah. Yeah, is that something unique to Strongman Champions League, or is that, like, cumulative time something you've seen in other shows? What's that? Oh, for a team competition, you mean? Yeah, like the cumulative time idea. I mean, that's just kind of – logistically speaking, probably the best way to do an event like that. You know, there. otherwise you do the event together, like two-man log or the two-man truck pull, or uh, you do separate parts and just give one time with no splits, like the yoke and the frame carry. <clears throat> this is kind of cool. You know, it was a – I think it was my second time – doing a two-man team competition. Uh, the other time was in Russia with a guy named Andy Vincent. And that was the only other time I did a two-man log, and it was for Max. Um, Is that uh, Matt Vincent's brother? Yeah. Yeah, Matt Vincent's brother. From uh, Hate Brand? Yep, that's him. He's like a Highland Games, uh, right? Wasn't he in Highland Games too, Andy? Highland Games world champion. Matt was the world champion. Andy right. was the... Uh, He's definitely professional, and I don't know what level he got to as a pro. But yeah. he's a damn good athlete, really good. That was why I picked him for my team. He was a former NFL player, and I know if you, we if we went to Russia, Russia was going to try and screw with us some way. Yeah. So I yeah. needed somebody that was going to be mentally tough to do it. And we <laughs> actually – the flight got well, – no, the flight didn't get messed up. We had the wrong visa. So we had to spend an extra day at JFK – running to the Russian embassy, getting a different stamp and a different visa and almost not getting it because my passport was completely full. And, we, you know, it was the second day we were there, we were getting our passports back from the embassy. And this Russian guy is handing the passport back to Dion Wessels because she was helping us out. She was our coordinator. He hands Andy's back and goes, oh, his, uh, his problem with, with this passport is uh, no room. And I was like panicking, going, oh, shit, we're not going to go because my passport's full. And as he thumbs through, I see the last page only had two stamps on it. I went, I don't see anything on that last page. <laughs> he goes, okay, slaps the visa in there, sticks, gives it to me. And we were freaking off, man. <laughs> but then uh, because we were on a different flight, delayed, we ended up getting to Russia four hours before the competition started. So we had time to get some shitty white bread and mayonnaise with celery or something on it, sandwich, put our stuff down, and then go to the competition site. And then we ended up winning four events to one. I think the only one that we lost was the two-man log, but everything else we won. <laughs> and that's why I knew I needed somebody tough, mentally tough, that wasn't going to fall apart to go to that contest with. <laughs> So, yeah, when it comes to a two-man team or, hell, even a four-man team, you know, if you've got even one guy who just doesn't quite have it mentally, it's going to bring a whole team down crashing. You know, and that's why it's so, it's so important to have someone like Jonathan who 
you know, he he passed out in the middle of an event and says, no, 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 we're going to finish this. Like, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it'll be. I've never seen a team uh, show before this, and it was awesome to watch the team dynamic. And also, like like I said, the implements they chose were just really cool looking. Yeah, Ilka puts a lot into this show. It's always a good show every year. Yeah. So that's the first of the SCL uh, shows that I wanted to talk about this evening. The other one, Travis, uh, I won't bury the lead. You went on to win. Like, I'm crowning you the king of Portugal now. <laughs> not a bad place to rule that's for sure it was beautiful there man we, we got to get beach. we got to get you a crown so you can uh alternate your uh your typical cowboy hat and crown another day and switch on and off <laughs> i'll take that <laughs> no, it was it was a good contest for me i you know i was fortunate to have you know a full week of rest because i kind of tweaked my hamstring obviously i tore it at, at world's um, but I, I felt it kind of light up a little bit when I was warming up for the yoke in our yoke frame carry, uh, two man medley. And, um, yeah, just, I, I just babied it, took it, you know, day by day and, and did whatever rehab I could on it. And then, uh, <clears throat> really, I just, I had a little talk with myself on the bus ride over to the competition. Cause we had about a 30 minute drive from the hotel to the contest site. And I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I just kind of zoned in and was halfway asleep. And I was telling myself, you're not going to have any pain. In fact, what you're going to do is you're going to turn that little piece of hamstring off and you're going to use everything else. It's not even going to activate. You're going to use everything around it. You're going to go as hard as you need to because you're going to kick ass and we're not going to have any pain, no pain, no weakness, only strength and power. And I just kept repeating that to myself throughout the day. And it paid off, as you can see there. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, that kind of set the tone for the day. And then that deadlift just felt perfect. The deadlift was just the right height for me. It was one of those days where just, you know, all cylinders were firing. And I think the, the reps to beat was seven put up by the guy who won the competition a couple of years ago, Oleg uh, Sika or Silka. And he did seven. And I saw how some of the other guys were doing. And I saw the guys who were supposed to go after me. And I knew that if I beat the seven, that was going to be enough. So I just kind of went out there. I kept telling myself eight, just repeating it, eight, eight, eight. And the whistle blew, and shit, 20 seconds later, I'd won the event. So <laughs> it was it was a great start. Let's just put it that way. And that yeah, looked like, what, about a 15-inch deadlift? Yeah, or 16, something like that, with a little bit of flex in the bar, not a whole lot. But I could see if you, you know, if you started to struggle or if you got a little forward on your toes and it started to wobble, it would really screw with you. You know, or if you if you were a real fast off the floor kind of puller and then slow to lock out, it would bury your ass because you get that whip and it would just take you right back down to the ground. But, you know, for me, I just I'd pull a slack out and then just fire and, and my lockout's really strong. So it just every rep just felt really good. I just timed them perfectly. And, you know, it was all for me, it was all ass. It was all glutes. I didn't even feel my hamstrings on the whole thing. <laughs> That's all. And Jonathan, you competed at that show as well, uh, like we say, a week after Finland. So how did that deadlift go for you? What are your impressions? Uh, just about the opposite, I would say. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, I had a on. The, I don't know which event it was. I think it may have been on the frame carry, but I had like a like an SI joint injury, which I've I've dealt with in the past, and um and and it's it's frustrating because it's not a real injury. It's not like a torn bicep or something. It's like a, you know, but it's, it, I'd call that a real injury. When your yeah, leg you know, work, that's a hell of an injury. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of shooting down my left hamstring and almost felt like I could, or my right hamstring almost felt like it couldn't like contract. It was in a lot of pain and everything. And, but I thought like Travis thought, uh, like Travis said, I thought, well, we got a week off in between. Maybe I can, but like all of the, 
sitting on the the travel day from from Finland down to Portugal was brutal. Um, and we we had a we got up I think at four thirty in the morning to get a, a five something five five a.m. train. Took that that was like a five hour train or so to get to Helsinki Airport. Then from Helsinki I was flying to Amsterdam. Had like a little bit of a layover there. Then finally Amsterdam to Porto. Travis didn't even make it to Porto <laughs> that day. Yeah. He got stuck in the airport, and and I didn't even get to the hotel. So we woke up what what like you know four thirty in the morning. I didn't make it to the hotel in Portugal till eleven thirty that night. And just all the sitting like really just beat my back up. And so the um yeah, it's just real fun to watch watch uh, somebody zero. <laughs> but this this same setup I did two years ago and got three reps. And the way my deadlift training had been going leading up to this, I thought, man, you know, the, the way everything's feeling, I think I might be good for five or six. So to, so to get up there and just have it not move at all. And and I think, I know you, you guys probably have this experience too. If you have a back strain or a back injury and you pull on a deadlift and it doesn't move, it almost hurts worse than if it did move and you yeah. finish it up, you know? Yeah. And I, so unfortunately, I think that's event- true. If you, if any time that I pull a deadlift and miss, I know I'm going to be totally screwed for the next few days. I'd yeah. rather grind out a rep for like six or seven seconds than pull for three or four and it not go anywhere. That That yeah. is the worst feeling. <laughs> so, forget, so forget I brought up the deadlift. Let's talk about this awesome frame that you did. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the frame here, I, I, I determined, him. you know, I, I zeroed the first event and, and I've had contests before where an event didn't go my way and I really got kind of down in the dumps and then I ended up doing well anyway. So I thought, you know, regardless of how the day goes, um, I'm going to have a short memory with this. I'm going to forget this event and and turn it on for the next. And I'm not quitting. I'm not going to, I'm going to finish the contest regardless of how my back feels, even if I have to, you know, <laughs> wheelchair through an event or something. But um, so, so I was, I was determined to, to keep going. Uh, and then, and this event actually, the, the, Frame was light enough that I was able to to pick it up and move even with the with the the lower back and the hamstring. Um, so that was that was a little encouraging. The other thing I was thinking too, and Travis and I talked quite a bit about this, uh, is just the opportunity to be in a setting like this. I was trying to really absorb all of the the size. I mean, it's a beautiful location, and as you can see, this company MSF Fitness they make some really awesome looking equipment. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to enjoy this experience. Try to do as best as I can on the rest of these events, even starting off with a zero. And and thankfully, this frame did go pretty well. It wasn't a, wasn't the top time, but uh, um, but I felt pretty good about it. So it was a cool frame to watch, anyway. Yeah, it was yeah. a good frame to use, and it was really cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and by the way, for anybody watching who has not yet liked the stream, what are you waiting for? Like the stream, subscribe to the channel, write down in your little notepad to go over to Hunger Smash Fitness and subscribe there when we're done here. All good things. We deserve it. We work hard. Come on. All right. <laughs> moving on. Yeah, moving on. There was some circus dumbbell at that contest as well. Uh, we want to take a look at that. I think we tied on that one. Yeah, we both – a little bit of a frustrating event, I think, for both of us. I think we were both yeah. capable of some more. If you see the videos, we both had some real close, like, you know, here when it needed to be here kind of lockouts, you know. like, <laughs> But – um. Nice looking dumbbell. The the problem with it was the handle was I'm used to training on like a two and a half or three inch, so like Coke can basically. This one, uh, I don't know if it's smaller than that. It felt smaller, and it was a long handle. So normally you fit your hand in there, and you got only about that much room between the the bells. This one you had, I don't know. I, th- I want to say it was like maybe a maybe a six inch uh, handle. So there's a lot of um, that means you can't brace your hand against the side of it. There's a lot of wiggle room this way, if if that makes sense. See, personally, for me, I liked that better because I got really long forearms, and it just fits me more comfortably than those short ones because the, the short ones end up making me – and I think this is why my dumbbell has sucked so freaking bad the last couple of years because I've trained with one of those, and it just screws me all up, and I have to pull the whole thing way out, and then it gets really you know, heavy out here because I can't get it in there. If I, if I try to get it in tight, I get so – jacked up in, in the forearm and the shoulder that I get this horrible ripping feeling in my shoulder. So yeah, you know, but, but no excuse. I could adapt. And in the warm ups, I felt the spot that I needed it. I just only hit that spot on one rep. So, <laughs> but you know, coming back next time, I think I would take more time between each rep 
and think about where I've got it. And then uh, I think just in practice, I need to really work on my footing because I just felt like I was getting pulled forward on my toes every time. And then that just sucked the energy out of my legs. So just, yeah, just one excuse after another. My dumbbell sucked. There you go. <laughs> oh, man, I'm bringing up bad feelings. Which event would you like to discuss? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, there was know, a tire flip. What'd you think of the tire flip? Personally, I liked that last event. It was a drag race. It was quick. Oh, yeah. And the tire was really nice. It was a brand new tire, so you had lots of tread. You can kind of grab the sides of the tread rather than open your biceps up and have to grab the bottom. You know, this is where it gets dangerous. If you can keep your hands turned. Yeah, that was uh, it was a really nice tire. It was about 900 pounds. Yeah, and it was just tall enough the where you, you want it to be the width of it to be tall enough that you can get your chest up against it and start the motion by driving into it with your chest rather than pulling up with your biceps. Because it's a, kind of a risk for a bicep injury on this type of event. And it, it was a nicely balanced tire that way. On my run, unfortunately, this is what I was talking about where I said I'm going to finish no matter what. The guy I went against, I competed with him a couple years ago too, Fabio Silva. He's a Portuguese strongman, real, real, strong, real strong kid. Um, he had injured his lat on something. And I was dealing with this SI joint thing. I mean, I could barely walk without a limp, but I thought, you know, I'll, I'm just going to get these freaking sandbags. Off. Limping. <laughs> limping with the sandbag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was awful. Yeah. Um, it, luckily, one of, one of the guys there had some, had some uh, pain meds. Uh, didn't ask any questions as to how he was able to get them. Definitely controlled substances uh, from, <laughs> from my, my knowledge of meds from the hospital. But um, that helped a little bit. Uh, but it was still quite, quite a decent amount of uh, pain in, the, in my back and hamstring. But... Um, but with just one event left, I mean, you can't, you know, you got to have that mindset of just, just, you know, not, you can't quit. You got to, you got to finish. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And I normally love sandbag carries. That's one of my favorite events. Anything where you got to pick something up and run around with it. I mean, I, I love events like that. We so. kicked ass on the sandbags in, uh, in Finland. We had a little, yeah, that's true. That event that was went one thing well. we had a little mishap, uh, misunderstanding with the referees. <laughs> On the, the sandbags in Finland, there was four of them. He was supposed to do two. I was supposed to do two. Uh, we asked beforehand, because I had the injured hamstring, like, can he do three and me just do one? And the referee said yes, but I think he misunderstood exactly how we intended to do these because I was supposed to at least attempt the second one before tagging him in to finish. So that was supposed to be like a, the time penalty for me not being able to do my part. Uh, what we did was he just blasted through three of them and then tagged me in for the last one. So all I had to do was pick it up and load it. I didn't have to run back and risk tweaking the hamstring on the sprint back. So, yeah, as soon as uh, as soon as I picked the last one up, we're being yelled at. You can see in the video, you know, I'm holding the bag, walking. I'm over here talking to the judge. It's like, well, shit, you know. <laughs> So they gave us a, a time penalty on that, and that was one of those that cost us a few places. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll dig that one up as well. But after this incredible effort on a uh, an injury and limping, Jonathan, I got to give you a heart on this one. There you go. We'll click the like button. <laughs> 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 All right, let's find the one Travis is talking about here. So this will now, be now, – Now, Travis's race was awesome because we, we all knew they had, they had just called out the points – that Irvin had sneaked Irvin Toots, um, who is also a, has been to World Strongest Man a few times and stuff. Irvin Toots had sneaked ahead of Travis um, by a half a point with with one event left to go. So we all knew as they went through the groups of this. Uh, this is still talking about Portugal of the tire flip and sandbag thing. We all knew that it was going to be whoever won that race was going to win the whole thing. So it was it was really fun to watch. And and um, after you play this uh, this footage here. Actually, this is me against Irvin. Yeah, this is you and Irvin. And Irvin, Irvin can hustle, so I was pretty, pretty jacked to be, uh, uh, pretty stoked to be uh, keeping ahead of him because Irvin's, Irvin's no joke when it comes to moving events. And then you'll see on this third bag, uh, you can't hear the noise, but but somebody blows a whistle. Somebody says, "Wait, wait, wait!" And uh, as Travis picks up that fourth bag, he's literally turning his head to the side, having a conversation with the ref as he's trying to run with this fourth bag, which is kind of a kind of funny. I don't think I've seen something like that before. 
So you can see the ref over here. <laughs> trying to talk to him as he's trying to sprint with a. I'm thinking, what? What do you mean? Ah, screw it. Just finish the damn race, Travis. It's yeah. yeah. At this point, just you can't do anything. Just go. Yeah. So that was an immediate. Nope, nope. Can't do that. He's like, God dang it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that was another one. Like Travis said, this was one that was uh, an all-out sprint. And these bags, I think they were 120 kilos or something. So they, you know, 260 or whatever, 265, which for most of these guys wasn't a challenging weight. So it was more about all-out speed. And uh, and so we we knew it was going to be a tight race. And and it was one of those ones where you had a group of yeah three or four teams within a half second or so of each other. So getting a getting a uh, two-second time penalty for the mistake we made was kind of a put the nail in the coffin as far as us having a podium finish, unfortunately, but yeah. you know, it is what it is. We still, I felt good about that run. I thought, I thought we hustled. I thought Travis did awesome having the hamstring injury and still, still booked it down there with that bag. So I was, I was still proud of us even with the, with the, the broken rules there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Live and learn, live and learn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So just a quick reminder, anybody in the audience, if you have questions for Travis or Jonathan, feel free to let us know. We'll pop them up on the screen. Um, but yeah, was that, did we get through all the events? Well, yeah, I think there was uh, the, uh, the last one, me versus Irvin. That's a fun yeah. one to watch, I think. If you want to show that video, I think it's, I think Travis has the, it's the it on his Instagram. Yeah, it's on, it's on but, your Instagram. But that one was, yeah, like all of us other competitors were, we're on the edges of our seats watching it too. Cause you know, everybody who competes in strongman obviously is a fan of strongman also. And this was just yeah. a fun event to watch because you knew it was two really fast guys down to the wire. Whoever wins this event takes the whole thing. And it was like, you know, it was a cool moment to watch. Yeah. You want to point me to it, Travis? Uh, you have to scroll, probably, scroll up. Probably your most recent post right or close to it. It's uh keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, yeah, after it's there it in is. the middle there with the two tires, yeah. I see. Yeah. He definitely had the better start. Pulling it down was a better yeah. way to go. That was a good idea, yeah. I, I hadn't seen anybody else do that. That was creative. But I knew if you lined up right and flipped it one motion like that, that was the key. All I needed to do was line my hands up right and get set and then do it in one big flip, and I was going to be able to make up good time. And yeah. then uh, – So close. I forget what the times were, but within a second of – yeah, I mean, it was like, yeah. It was a, <laughs> a drag race for sure, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, – once I saw – I don't know. I, something in me said once once I pushed off the tire, just that split second before him, I knew I was going to have that one. I knew I was going to have it because the sandbags felt right. And I was 100% focused on him at that point. There were, I didn't even know where he was until I loaded the second one and I noticed he was behind me. So I just continued with my momentum up on top of the tire. And, you know, the rest, I just kind of blacked out after that. And whatever happened, yeah, like that shit right there, that, that just happens. <laughs> 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 that's when it just happened. Was he? Did he come in second? Was that for? Uh... I'm pretty sure we had first and second on that event. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did. Yep. Half a point. Wow. And then, yeah, he was a half a point in front of me going into that event. So, yeah, I had to win that in order to win overall. And he, well, he had to win it to win overall. So, there was no chance of a tie, unless no, there was no chance of a tie. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was winner take all, you know, and that was one of those I kind of – I had another one of those little talks with myself uh, just before that and said there's no pain, no weakness, and I just turned the hamstring pain and off. It was gone. It didn't matter anymore. This was the last event. Even if I felt something, it wouldn't have mattered you know, I was going to go 100%. Thankfully, you know, nothing happened. You know, I, it, I felt really good the whole day on that. But, uh, you know, thankful, you know, probably because of that little talk I had with myself on the bus. But, you know, it just uh, – it was one of those times where everything worked out, man. I was wondering who you're talking to. 
<laughs> He's up in the front seat, just talking to himself like a homeless guy. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> no, I mean, so the the one question I have for you is this: When you talk to yourself, do you think that you're as interesting as we think you are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I'm the funniest person in the world, which is why if you ever see any of the bullshit that I post, I really post it because I'm laughing my ass off at it. And hopefully someone else finds joy in it as well. But really, I just do it because I think it's funny as shit. You know, like the uh, the everybody thinks strong men are dumb thing. I just did that because I was laughing my ass off the whole time I was writing the sheets out. I'm like, this is fucking stupid and funny as hell. And I was having a good time with it, you know? And <laughs> thankfully, other people enjoy what, what I think is funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same way, man. I think I'm the funniest guy in the world, too. But I'll gladly take third place. So you're the funniest guy in the world. Kevin Hart's number two, and I'm number three. I'll there take that. All right. <laughs> That's good company. <laughs> no, but, you know, when... Uh, to get kind of halfway serious for a moment, it's important to talk to yourself, I think. And I've always had this thing, even since I was a kid, where I refer to myself as we or like let's go. So let us go. I've always referred to myself in the plural form. It's kind of weird. But then I realized that I'm talking to myself as though I've got this little person back here who's kind of sitting back and taking notes. And that person actually helped save me when I was going through all my mess, my darkness back in the day, you know, cause uh, it, it's more of a rational note taker back here. And then this part of Travis is just crazy. So he kind of keeps me grounded a little bit, <laughs> but you know, having that internal dialogue is definitely healthy. Don't sit on a corner and talk out loud to yourself and don't, for the love of God, start yelling at yourself when no one's around. You know, maybe just a couple barks here and there real quick. God damn it. You know, that kind of shit. But sometimes that's necessary. A couple little headbangs against the wall. But two is enough. Three is crazy. <laughs> that's the rule. That's the rule. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you've got that internal dialogue, then you always you know where your true north is. You know, that helps align your compass and balance you out when, you know, maybe the stress of a big competition when you're going into it with an injury can overwhelm you and cause you to make mistakes. So there, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it's good advice. Yeah, man. You, you always give us great advice, Travis. That's uh, Jonathan. You don't know this. We call Travis the world's strongest philosopher on both our channels. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Probably what a lot of people know about Travis is his strongman career. And uh, same with me. You know, I had, as when I was younger watching uh, World's Strongest Man and saw his early career and everything. Uh, but it was really interesting getting that we got, like I said, a lot of a lot of time in close proximity, whether we wanted to or not. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we actually did talk quite a bit about philosophy. And I mean, obviously yeah. a little bit about training, but I think a lot of people think like, you know, this is big meathead. He lives, lifts lifts weights really well and that's about it. But uh, yeah, I would say most of our conversation was philosophical topics and, you know, talking politics and religion and everything you're not supposed to talk about. But uh, it was it was a blast for sure. Yeah, uh, I got to say every strong man and strong woman I've talked to so far of all of them, I haven't found a meathead among them yet. <laughs> well, I think, you know, strong men, can't, we're the black sheep of the strength world. So already we're different. Yeah. You know, and, and to be able to do a sport like this, one, you, you've got to have not only loose screws, but missing screws. Um, but, you know, there's that fine line between genius and insanity. And I think we're kind of straddling that pretty well. So we're a little bit crazy, but you got to be a really smart to be a little bit crazy and then make it work. So, you know, that's that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Jonathan, so you talked about you, you watched Travis's early career. Who else did you watch? Uh, in your youth and uh, who would you enjoy watching? I just got to say something really quick. Just <laughs> yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Guys keep coming up to me and they're like, Oh man, you know, you're this and that. I used to watch you as a kid. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, that's really cool and all, but you know, <laughs> and now yeah. I know what it's like for those guys. When I started, 
you know, like in particular, Magnus Samuelson. I was like, you're my favorite. I used to watch you all the time when I was growing up. Like now I'm on the other side of that, looking at it, going, hey, shut up, you little punk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, so listen, I man, Travis, like Travis I, I watch you now, Travis. That's all I'll say. I watch you yes. now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm well, older than I'm older than you are, so you know, just uh take heart in that. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say. Is, is Travis said I are not actually I think we're only two or three years apart, so it's not like you know, I was a little kid and he was it's just that he started his career long before I I started mine. So in, in strong strongman years, I, I my first contest was uh 2015. I was. I always tell people too. I I was uh, in the novice class and took fourth place. So I like to always let people know that in case somebody new or something is watching. Or and uh, I was pretty discouraged. And I thought, oh, I don't know, maybe this sport isn't for me. But you know, fast forward a few years and things. <laughs> you put enough work in, you know, things can change. But um, uh, yeah, I, I I think I had always watched. You know, when it was, I guess, it would be on around Christmas or New Year's, and I had always watched with my dad, even in the the you know earlier days with. Uh, I think the the first clear memories I have it was when like Marius Pujanowski's uh, um, when he was kind of at the top for a number of years and then uh, but I yeah I remember the the era with uh, <laughs> Justin um, the era with uh, uh, Travis and and I think he was just a few a year or two ahead of uh, uh, Brian Shaw when he came on the scene and and Derek Poundstone and uh, I really admired those guys especially. Um, you know, Brian's a great athlete and he's still still in the sport, but but Travis and Derek had had this mentality that you could see come out in contests that that I always thought, you know, if I compete or when I compete or whatever, this this would be the mentality I would want to have where it's like an all out attack. It's not a uh, it's a and this is something that I still try to work on. Um, I was mentioning about my 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 brother a little earlier and his his competition style is sort of, you know, I always say mine is kind of more analytical. Like I try to look at the events and I try to think like who's going to finish where and where should my feet be and where should this be? My brother's strategy is typically like take the gas pedal and as far down as it goes, we'll keep it down there. And that's all he thinks about. And there's something to be said for that. Like there is value in having the the analytical approach and, but there's something to be said about being able to shut everything else out, shut out all the distractions and just let that berserker come out. And that's something that Travis has really mastered, I think. And uh, something that I learned <laughs> that I learned from watching his earlier career and, and guys like Derek Poundstone and stuff. And, but um, there's something to be said for for having access to that type of, of mentality uh, for competition because I think it really does help on some of those events. You know, working through an injury, let's say, or an event that's not your best, and just being able to turn on full gas and you know, <laughs> some, something I've always admired. <laughs> well, that kind of goes back to what I said about those missing screws. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and by the way, it looks like that Viper was four thirty five. Oh, there we go. So almost. Wow. Yeah. I guess that's like 197 kilos. Yeah, yeah, just shy of. I don't know. Has there ever been a, a, a 200 kilo Viper on record? The way he moved his feet, though, I think if he if he can like if he steadied himself in the hole and really turned it on and and charged up, he's got another 10 or 20 pounds in him. Like, watch how fast he does this. Like, there's no pause there. He just goes yeah. right into it. <laughs> kind of doesn't make sense when I when I watch it in person. Even. <laughs> what the hell that's that pretty happen? impressive, man. Yeah. God dang. <laughs> so that's something I need to get up. Is my my overhead ability is absolute sh crap. So yeah, we didn't we didn't talk. Speaking of that, we didn't talk about the first event, the log press. That was the one that we we did get to practice a little bit with the empty log, and I think we have a so I I my best press is like just under four hundred. I've I haven't broken the four hundred mark yet. I think Travis has gotten over over four. Uh, Not with the log. No, four. my log's been horrible lately. But this log was only two hundred sixty kilos, so you know roughly one hundred thirty each, which is around what is that? Uh, three eighty six. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. It's even lighter than three. So we thought weight wise we should be able to handle this, but in the warm ups or, or the the day before we just practiced with the empty log, like we picked it up two or three times. So we had this system where we we're going to go up, kind of. I was watching him out of the corner of my eye. He was kind of leading, and then we and then do the press together. We kind of press similar ways. Like if you had a guy who was a split jerk and another guy who was more of a strict presser, it wouldn't work so well. But we kind of had a similar dip and drive. The problem was that at the bottom we we said you know we'll drop it down to the bottom. We'll take a second to reset and we'll. But the guys like 
uh, you know, the other team we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, Danis and Ivars, they were just going right into it. And once we got into our second or third rep, I was thinking, man, you know, we could be doing these faster. Like I'm not really gassed much. And, but in the middle of the event, it was hard to, to adjust like that. So we ended up, I think we got four reps and I think the winning team was seven, maybe eight. We came I, close on the fifth. Yeah. Yeah. We came close to a fifth, but that was the other thing. I pressed the fifth and I was like to here, almost locked out. And Travis was just starting his press. And with the way the, the physics work on that, once the one side is up, this guy is pressing so much more weight. So if we had gotten to practice beforehand, I would have realized the strategy then, if you see that your partner isn't up, you come back to the chest and then you both start and do it together, then it's easy. So, you know, again, with the, but just since we had brought up overhead press, I thought since we hadn't talked about that event, uh, um, that was that was one that, that I think our capability was quite a bit more than what we were able to put in. Very interesting though, I, I wish, I would love to try it just in training, even if I don't ever have it again in a contest because it's a super interesting event to, to time something as dynamic and explosive as a log press with another person attached to the yeah. same log that you're attached to. It's a very attached to the same log. Yeah. Yeah. You very, very feel, yeah. You can feel when the other person kind of engages. And uh -huh. if you're a split second ahead or a split second behind, it's like either it doesn't freaking want to move or it's, you know, you can tell that you're off, you're behind. And if you're behind, you get pulled forward. And yeah, it's, there's a lot, to an event like that, especially when you start throwing in a push press. Yeah. Like you were doing. If there was any kind of push jerk, which I've seen, I feel like I saw Misha and another guy do a push jerk on a two man log. How they timed that is just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great. Did either of you have a video posted about that event? No, that's, yeah. That's the one thing that we didn't, unfortunately. A lot of these yeah. concepts that I've done in the past, uh, my, my wife has come along. She's a, a flight attendant, so she gets kind of discounted flights. So she's usually my my videographer for these. But uh, given the having the baby and everything, it kind of wasn't an option this time. So we were kind of just randomly handing our phones to bystanders uh, to, to to get video footage. Um, so that one, unfortunately, we didn't didn't get a didn't get a shot of. Yeah, I was looking. I couldn't find one. Uh, but you know, I miss things sometimes. I'm uh... yeah. I, I, I get things 99.3% of the time, but for that other 0.7, I need some help. Yeah. <laughs> now there is, it, it, it may, it may end up on there on the contest footage. The thing with SCL, I see this all the time in the comments uh, on their posts and they, they don't really, they don't put a ton of effort into their social media. They'll post yeah. stuff. But they don't, there's yeah. no interaction. So I always feel bad when I see people commenting like, Oh, you're never going to get a response, you know? But, yeah. So just in case anybody's listening or watching, so they do show it on, on European TV. I think it's in like 90 countries or something, they've told me. The U.S. and the U.K. not being one of those countries, unfortunately. Well, I've, I've seen uh, I've seen like 2017, 2018, and 2019. On like MSG or one of those, it's right? It's on like local sports networks, yeah. Yeah, I have two, just randomly. Um, but they do also have a streaming site. Uh, that I think they do like a free two week trial, and then I forget how much it is monthly, but you can just pay for a month. It's like seven ninety nine a month. It's like yeah, months. and you just watch the contest you want to, and then so for for anybody who's you know maybe in your audience or something who's wondering, there, there is uh, strongmanworldseries.com. Yeah, and you could go to and there's there's content all the way back to twenty thirteen. You can watch like Zadrin. Oh, there we go. Hey, buddy. <laughs> uh, you can watch co old contests with like guys like Zadrunas and Irvin Katona and some of some of the some of the older guys in the sport from when yeah. Travis was just a newbie in the sport all the way up to, you know, more recent times. And a lot of guys that have ended up in, you know, Eddie Hall and Thor and all those guys uh, got their start in, in champions league. So it's kind of an interesting site. If you're a fan of strongman to go check that out. And I think it's, it's worth the uh, subscription fee, even if you just get it for a month or two, just to watch some of that stuff. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, yeah, 99 yeah. a month. It's nothing. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a no brainer. I mean, Strongman Champions League, he was uh, accomplished before that, but that's where Ivar's really got his notoriety. He won, I think, yeah. the whole the whole thing, the whole point standing for the whole year in 2019, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah. Did he win that in 2019? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Danis uh, won it the year before. Right. right. Yeah, yeah because they said when he, he thrown Danis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right because Ivar's is a badass, man. He's tough. Yeah, I, I had to compete with him in my friggin' group at World Strongest Man. He made the final last year, and uh, you know he was he was put out of the final this year, just barely. But you know the two guys from my group were Shaw and uh, 
Maxime Boudreaux, who were second and third in the finals. So we, we, we've been through this. Like everybody kept <laughs> talking about group five, and I always said group one was the hardest group. I think group five had four just you know, Irvin Toots kind of got thrown in last minute and wasn't maybe mentally prepared, but the four other guys were savages, you know. But uh, I think my group was probably the other hardest group, at least because, you know, the two guys that went through ended up second and third in the friggin' final. You know, they were going to be really tough to beat. And, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, this is how it worked out. But anyway, just to get back to Ivar's, you know, he, he's only continued to improve since then. Yeah. Uh, Ivar's and I are actually trying to work something out for him to come on in a few weeks. Cause he's going to be in the States for the Shaw classic. So uh, the time zones will work out a little better. So we're trying nice. to work something out. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a good guy. Funny, funny too. Very, very funny. Him, him and Dana together are just, yeah. Oh, really? Most of it you probably couldn't repeat, but it's just yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, we, we always talk. We, we were talking about that this time. That if there's no way it would ever get approved because no network would pick it up, it'd be too risky. But if you could have a, a, a like a embedded cameraman just in the athlete tent and the and the after party and whatever else for Champions League, I mean, it's just so much so entertaining. It's <laughs> you'd probably have to censor it some way, but you could you know, it could be like real talk with strong men or something. And yeah, yeah, something like I, that. It'd probably sell. People would people would pay to watch it. So there'd be a, a lot of censorship and a lot of uh especially at the after party as it gets later into the evening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These guys, I gotta give them credit because you know, we, we always say we come over there and we feel feel kind of stupid being being Americans only speaking one language or, or one and maybe another one poorly. Everyone from these other countries, it's it's convenient for us, but the common language is English. But they've all learned to swear very well in English. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other guy that I've been uh I I got tips that I should interview that he's like a fun loving good interview is uh Christoph Radzikowski. I don't know if you guys have ever come across him at all. I know yeah. Christoph. Oh yeah. I competed yeah. with him uh, one, one time last year in Curacao, but got to compete with him once before. It looks like he's uh, kind of on the road to retirement now. Yeah, that's what Marcel told me. He's retired. So it'd, be, it'd still be fun to have an interview because he's probably got a, you know enough stories to go forever. <clears throat> he was one of the guys. Uh, he is a couple spots ahead of me on that all-time list of greatest strongmen. Uh, I think I was number 14. But since I've been back to Worlds, I would have enough points, I think, to beat Jeff Capes in the 13th spot. Um, I think it was Jeff Capes that was right ahead of me. But Kristoff uh, was like eighth mm -hmm. from the sheer volume of contests, you know, national championships and, and international shows that he's done, in addition to World's Strongest Man and, you know, top placing in so many of them. It, it's funny that you describe it that way because the discussion I was having with maybe I shouldn't say who it was, but the discussion I was having was Travis Ortmeyer has the best stories in all of Strongman, and he <laughs> said to me, "The other guy like that is Kristoff." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's, yeah, I did say it's about right. <laughs> Most of those stories will never be on uh, video. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny they're for the uh after live stream chat <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> live stream after dark so uh we've been talking about a lot of really interesting stuff got to learn all about both of your uh scl competitions and uh, get some more details and behind the scenes stuff on what happened there anything you guys want to plug or you know kind of as you decompress from those shows what you have on the horizon for the future that you might want to discuss before we wrap up for the evening I'll let Jonathan go first if you got anything. Yeah, I guess uh, f future coming up. Um, my goal this year, I'm, I'm kind of putting most of my eggs in one basket with SCL and try, trying to make the finals. So uh, the way they do it is interesting because there's 16 competitions. You you can either do really well at one or two and accrue a lot of points that way, or you can do, you know, if you're finishing in the middle of the pack, you might have to do a few more contests. And um, But it's basically total points at the end of the season determines who goes to the finals. I think it's top 12. And uh, I started off with some points because I was able to compete last year in 
in uh, Norway before things started shutting down. Um, so if I if I can get, uh, unfortunately with, with Portugal, I didn't get as many points as I was hoping um, with that one. But if I could get a, another contest, I think I might have a good shot at making the finals and um, see how I do this year uh, going there. I've also signed up for uh, strong, official Strongman Games, which is like a Giants Live qualifier. Um, that's in November. And then I may do the show in uh, the one the one we were talking about at the beginning with um, uh, the Manning Brothers show in uh, in uh, Colorado. So probably probably two or three more shows for the rest of the year. But I got to get this back injury sorted out first. And then um, as far as plugs, I, I have a, I work with Tough Wraps for equipment, um, uh, so you can check them out. They make you know knee sleeves and all that stuff. And then uh, um, Fusion Sport Performance is with my uh, supplement guy that I work with. It's actually kind of a it's kind of a small business. Um, a guy had no, known for years from New Jersey, and um, but he's got really good products. Uh, I started working with him about a year or so ago, and um, so you could check that out if you're looking for a different pre workout. And then I do my coaching with uh, Simon Diesel Yates, his name is um, on Instagram. Simon Yates, he's uh, Adam Bishop's coach. And he actually was nice enough to come over to Portugal. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Oh, yeah. the I would have wanted to, to him to see. You know, I would, I would have hoped to do better, but uh, it was nice having him there, though. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for, for plugs and everything and future plans. How about you, Travis? Fantastic. And now you have a second friend from New Jersey, Jonathan. Oh, I didn't know you're from there. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Maybe we do something together with fusion one day. Who knows? Yeah. What, what part of, uh, what part of Jersey are you in? Uh, are you familiar at all? Like, would you know Paramus? Oh yeah. That's very close to, I, I grew up in Kinalon. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, uh, let's say, close to Paramus. I won't divulge to the entire internet my exact coordinates. Yeah, yeah. Wherever <laughs> all the malls, just look for all the malls. And that, that's what <laughs> But it's yeah, funny. It's so, like, okay, so you grew up in Jersey and you're in Colorado now. Do you know um, uh, Anthony San Lorenzo? Sure do, yeah, yeah. Same, same idea. He grew up around here and he's also in Colorado. Yeah, I think he's from Bergen County or something or, yeah. Yeah, I'm in Bergen County as well, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, next yeah, time we gotta we we gotta like have a party for the holidays. You guys come on over. We'll uh, grab some good pizza or something. My uh, my brother actually trains with Johnny Wazico, who's down in. Uh, he's a one hundred and five kilo pro. He's down in um, Clark, I think, is where his gym is. He is. Um, are, are you are you familiar with him? Of course, Johnny was. Yeah. yeah, he was at he was at Clash on the Coast. Johnny and I have uh, talked a little bit on Instagram. I'm trying to actually put together something with him where um, I'm a member of a professional network and uh, we're looking okay. for like you know perks for the network. So I reached out to him I'm like, hey, would you be interested in uh, doing something out of your gym, like an intro to strongman for someone who's never done it before? And maybe we do like a group rate or whatever. So I think that'll be pretty cool. But yeah, Johnny was is awesome. Yeah. He just competed in Russia recently. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he won uh, the Masters, 105 Masters or something. It's pretty, pretty cool. But uh, yeah, he's definitely – my brother trains with him regularly, and I do when I go back and visit. And he's another guy that's just a wealth of information. He's been been in the sport a long time. So That's awesome. Definitely yeah, some give good, a shout-out when you're back in the area, man. I'd, I'd love to hang out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, New Jersey doesn't have a bad uh, – not a bad strongman scene, though. But anyway. Yeah, for sure. Cool. But go, ahead, go ahead, Travis. What do you have on the horizon? Oh, uh – Couple seminars. Got World Strongest Seminar September fourth in San Antonio. If you go to uh, Heavy Metal Fitness Instagram page, you can get a hold of Michelle that way and sign up. It's going to be me, Gabriel Pena, Josh Thigpen, and uh, Trey Mitchell the third. And uh, it's going to be pretty badass. I, I just the way she set it up, the things that she's got going. It's going to be an awesome seminar. So if anybody's in the area or wants to come out September fourth. Go to Heavy Metal Fitness on Instagram and uh, hit them up. Then, uh, yeah, I've got my sponsor, Cerberus, Bill Fast Formula, and uh, Mother of Macros. If you uh, check out my bio on Instagram, I've got all my links on one thing, including a link to my coaching page. So if you're looking to be coached, I am a strong man and just strength athletics in general coach. So hit me up. Uh, there we go. The first one, zero shoes. If you like no sold shoes, you can really feel the ground. Those things are awesome. They're really, they're made for feet. They're really wide toe box. The first time I put my pair on, it was like slipping my hand into a glove. It was freaking awesome. I was sold on them. And uh, I'm saying that since before I ever tried to sell their stuff on my page. So yeah. And, and that's true of pretty much everything I ever work with. I, I'm not going to work with anything if it sucks. So 
<laughs> There's that. But yeah, so check out my Instagram page, Travis underscore Ortmeyer, and uh, click on the link in my bio. I sound like an OnlyFans girl when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, which, you know, we were speaking of OnlyFans, we were talking about some of the interesting requests we've both gotten over uh, DMs and, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, of that too. Some inter interesting stuff people decide. I'm still waiting. If I get that offer for five hundred dollars for my used underwear, hundred percent. You better bet yeah. your ass I'm selling them. Has, has this happened since <laughs> SCL this year or before that? What's that? Since has this happened since SCL this year or before that? You know what? I haven't checked all my uh, message requests since I got home, so I can't say. But <laughs> yeah, before that, I mean, I had. Over the years, you just you you accumulate some real interesting requests and messages. Just people are weird, man. People are freaking weird. Which you know, no judgment here. Whatever you're into, as long yeah. as you're not trying to force it on someone else, you do you do you, pal. I mean, <laughs> I, I think there's only like one logical thing to ask for. I would like an atlas stone that Travis Ortmeyer lifted. That'd be kind of cool. all right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Can I get on the list for that too? That was probably four hundred plus pounds. Okay, so I got a few of those. I got a few of those. Yeah, entry level for me, please. Yeah. Actually, on that topic, I um someone asked me about this about two weeks ago, and I I figured it was a great comment or a great question to ask Travis specifically when he comes on, um, but. Someone that I know, he competes in powerlifting and he's considering switching to strongman, but he doesn't have any access to Atlas stones. Um, and so basically what he wanted my opinion on um, was how much does a deadlift, training a deadlift, translate over to lifting Atlas stones? Not and I really basically told him, I mean, yeah, okay. There's so many him, different biomechanics that come into play. I mean, how long are his arms? How how big is his gut? No, he's, um, he's a, a shorter, stocky fellow. So, I mean, if, if you've got arms that can get around the stone, obviously it's going to make all the difference because lifting a 400 pound stone, all you need technically is a little over a 400 pound deadlift. I mean, or maybe a deficit deadlift because your hands are all the way at your feet. But if you can't get your arms around it, you could have a 900-pound deadlift and not be able to lift a 400-pound stone mm -hmm. because it's all about the grip. It's all about the arms on the stone. So <clears throat> nowadays we have the benefit of some of the ridiculous tacky that we have out there. You know, when I first set, when I first broke the 500-pound barrier with the with Atlas stones. It was 2006. I think it was a week after the Arnold in 2006 or a week before the Arnold 2006. And, uh, you know, the tacky that we had was the old school Harpix Ray-Ban handball glue it was nothing super special. It was just, uh, what modern day tacky, it would kind of be equated to some of the cold weather tacky that's almost like syrup when it gets warm. And it just so happened that that stuff worked pretty decently well in Houston in March because it was only, you know, 80 degrees instead of 110 degrees, you know. But uh, <clears throat> back to what I, the original point was, we have tacky that is so good nowadays that, you know, guys like Eddie Hall – who would just slather some of that elite stuff on, they could just stick to the side of the stone and then just kind of all they do is pull it to their belly and then use their belly to put it up. So if you can master that technique, then he would be fine. He would just need to have the arm strength, you know, enough to pull it into his body and then his body strength enough to load the stone. So, <clears throat> yeah, I guess, uh, you know, in a roundabout sort of way, the deadlift only matters in as much as it needs to be a little bit higher than the stone you plan to lift. The deficit deadlift. So does that all make sense? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's basically what I told him, but I was like, I, I have 
someone who's well renowned for lifting stones coming on the channel in a little bit and i'm, I'm gonna ask him so <laughs> um, cause, yeah move. basically because yeah like when i first started training stones within a short matter of time i'd done the 365 with no tacky and then i did a 385 for a double with tacky um and that was before i i had a 600 pound deadlift and so it was one of those things where i was like okay cool and then i was watching some of the other guys at the gym doing it and there were a couple guys that had an 800 plus deadlift and they couldn't budge the 365 and so i i told them about that and i was like it's it's kind of one of those things where some people are just better at it due to yeah like arm length or i think part of it too like i grew up working on dairy farms and just moving around weird funky equipment all the time and so I don't do as well with a, a regular bar. I do better with this if it's odd shaped. Uh, if just, I can, yeah. If, yeah, if I can just find a weird grip on it and hang on for dear life, kind of. Um, <laughs> so that's that's kind of what I told him. But I was like, I want to. I have someone that I I want to ask specifically that, about. That kind of brings me into the last and and arguably most important part of lifting an atlas stone. <clears throat> if you stand over the top of it and think about it. Excuse the language, but it will mind fuck you. You have to just <laughs> grab and go. No hesitation, no fear, no no holding back. Just go. Grab it, pull. The faster yeah. you can grip and grip it correctly and then just pull off the ground, the better it's going to be. Yeah. I, I have one more question, I guess, actually. This is more for, for me than um, nobody else has asked me to ask this. But... Um, Cause when I do stones, I do like a, like a Vulcan grip, I guess, if you want to call it. And so I, I split my fingers and I just shove them as far under the stone as I can until, until they're getting ideally until I can get them to touch, which realistically doesn't really happen. But I used that's to do the same in thing. my mind. That's what I'm shooting for. I used to um, do the same thing. I, I would try to do that, but you know, after, after breaking this finger on a Jam tire, I can't bunch. quite spread this hand out as much. I can do it yeah. by left, fine, but this one, it doesn't quite go as far. So li just live long. It's it's lacking the prosper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, live long and prosper with that hand. But, yeah. <laughs> but okay. uh, yeah, you know, now I don't think I mess with trying to jam my fingers that far under. I think I just... I get them under, I feel the ground because you start smashing your fingernails and then you just go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was, that's kind of how I've been doing it. And then I I was working with someone else who was just trying stones. And the, the first time he did it, he tried to do that and caught his fingernail on like a little pebble or something in the concrete or something. And then the stone rolled right over and the next day, whole end of his finger was all black and like, we're like, oh well, I don't think it's broken. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was like, I, I, I made the mistake. Happen. I made the mistake of trying to spot my father on an Atlas stone lift once. Yeah, and it was like three thirty or something like that. And I remember reaching under to try and like try to spot it up, and he dropped it right at that time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> These two fingers had this weird, like from the the last digit. I had this like dark purple line that went around. It was like they just smashed it and wanted to explode outward, but the skin was holding it in. And I had it on both of these fingers for like six weeks after. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how his finger was, except it was all along the top of it here. And uh, and it was just the one finger and it was just, you know, just the, the distal portion. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, Sucks. Hasn't happened to me yet, but uh, sorry that had to happen to you. I mean, at least he was jamming his hands under there. Go yeah, at, yeah, and at least he got, got it. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, well, now you got yeah. me going. Now I want to ask a question. So what's easier, uh, a natural stone lift or an atlas stone lift? Because in an atlas stone, you can squeeze, but on a natural stone, you got more places to grab. I personally do better with atlas stones. Um. I don't know, maybe because I've got more practice with an atlas stone. I just I know how to grab and go, and there's one balance point. With a natural stone, you got to really figure out the balance points. There may be a lot of hand grips, but there may only be one that is viable. You know where the stone won't roll forward or backward. 
Plus with the Atlas Stone, when you hit that triple extension, it's going to roll up smoothly. Yeah. And the, yeah. The, the irregular surface of a natural stone, I think you that that clean portion of it, you kind of it gets tricky. I think. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. 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 I guess I haven't gotten to a heavy enough weight to make it tricky yet. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I was going to say because like I think it really depends on the natural stone because I've had some like 200 some pound stones that are just miserable to try and lift. And then I've had some, you know, mid three hundreds that are pretty easy just because the, the handholds are just perfect on them and everything. And so I think it partly just depends on the stone as well. Um, whereas the Atlas stone, they're all uniform. So once you get the technique down, yeah. it's, it's the same for all of them. Yeah, absolutely. At least in my limited opinion, <laughs> limited experience. <laughs> I think I think you're right on. I think you're right on. <laughs> yeah, with my amateur level strongman experience. <laughs> hey, listen, man, I'm the I'm the strongest man in all of the woods near my house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've met some pretty freakishly strong homeless people before, though, so you might want to be careful. I ran, I, I ran into one guy in those woods one day. And he's a long distance runner, so I got that dude. <laughs> yeah, he's not right. lifting anything. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna win that one. I, I don't know if I told Travis. I don't know if I told you the story on Instagram. It's the funniest thing. So you saw I had my kind of makeshift set up with uh, stone over bar, and I was doing natural stones. So one day, and I left it there, and it stayed like the deer left it alone. It stayed there for like a week, and so I go in there one day. And I do my my stones, and I walk the rest of the trail, jog the rest of the trail, whatever, uh, in search of logs to lift. And so I run into this guy, like, doing his long-distance running. And he, he goes, uh, hey, were you setting up a campsite over there or something? And I said, oh, what are you watching me? He says, yeah. I said, no, like, I have a strongman channel. I got to prove I can do this stuff myself. Okay. <laughs> what, what's your channel? <laughs> but, yeah, he thought I was setting up a campsite. <laughs> <laughs> hey, to each their own, I guess. Well, I thought <laughs> so. you'd get a kick out of that one. That's funny. That's, yeah. I mean, you kind of said it, it, it looks like a spit. Are you going to roast something over that, a fire? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just like every day I, I went in there and I'm like, I found this huge log I tried to squat. I'm trying to come up with different things to mimic. And I found that one branch with the fork in it. So I said, hey, let me find another branch and make a fork out of it. And we're good to go. <laughs> well so far it's worked for you yeah so far so good I, I, i've done overhead press i've done fingles fingers i've done stone over bar i've done a lot of stuff in the woods <laughs> i mean if you think about it that really is the history of strongman you know? kind of yeah hundreds yeah, of years ago two farmers with the adjoining farms and the one says hey i can pick this rock up and can you do it? And the other guy goes, yeah, look, I picked it up twice. And there you go, competition. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> I can throw it farther than you. I can put it over my head. You can't, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I found this uh, giant log. I tried to Steinborn. I couldn't quite get it. And so I come back the next day and it rained. So it soaked up the water. Now it's heavier. I'm like, oh, come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to wait on that one. <laughs> <laughs> my, my very first log, I remember driving around uh, – I think I was just in a friend's neighborhood and I just happened to look out the window of my truck and I saw this old fence post, you know, about eight or 10 inches of diameter and it was sitting in the ditch. And so I'm like, there, there, that's a log right there. Let's do that. And uh, I, you know, I had, I was 20 years old. I didn't have any freaking clue what I was doing. So I pull over and I pull this thing out of a wet ditch throw it in the back of my truck. I'm like, God dang, this thing is so heavy. I don't know if there's any chance I'll be able to press it, but whatever, we'll give it hell and we'll grow into it. So I bring it back to the house and uh, I start I start drilling into it and trying to make hand cutouts for the holes. And then, uh, you know, after a few days of working on it, it starts to dry out and it literally starts to disintegrate. And so I take a roll of duct tape, and I'm trying to tape this whole thing together. I'm like, I put in so much work so far. I don't want to lose it now. No, man, after after two weeks, it weighed maybe 60 pounds. It was dried out. Pieces were falling off. I pressed it overhead. I got a face full of shit. I was like, God dang it. All right, we'll chalk that one up to a learning lesson. 
And so a few weeks later, I was on the way to my girlfriend's house at the time. And right in front of her neighborhood is a four-way stop. They had a brand new telephone pole on each corner. Now, this was like Friday evening. So I figured they were going to put it up Monday. So I went to a friend of mine's house. I went over to a buddy's house and I asked him to borrow his chainsaw. And, you know, he said, yeah, sure. What are you going to use it for? I'm like, you don't want to know. Just let me borrow your chainsaw. So Sunday night, I pull up on the side of the road right next to one of these uh, telephone poles, crank the chainsaw, cut two sections out of it, throw it in the back of my truck and take off. I went to my girlfriend's house the next day. Three of them were up. And that fourth one was still laying there. So I can't, I can't imagine what those guys were thinking. Like, what the <laughs> hell happened to this thing? <laughs> well, that Who was, steals uh, telephone poles? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I, I just happened to cut a section that when I, I cut the handle handles out of it, it weighed right at 200 pounds. And those things are soaked in all kinds of nasty shit. I probably don't even want to know. Um, so it, it – was tough and it lasted a really long time. And uh, that turned out to be a really good log. <laughs> uh, you know, a good log that, that may or may not have given me cancer at some point in my life later on, who knows? Uh, but no, that one, that one worked out well. And I employed the lessons from that failed disaster beforehand. And, uh, you know, I learned a few things, so it probably worked out for the best. <laughs> But that's my story on how I got my first log. That's a great story, just like all your stories are. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let's. Uh, why don't we wrap it up, gentlemen? Thank you so much for joining us uh, again this evening, talking about Strongman Champions League, Finland, Portugal, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we really do appreciate it, and uh, maybe we talk again after your next competition. What do you say? Hell yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Definitely. Yeah. All yeah, right. th thanks for having me on. Thanks, guys. And, of course, for everybody watching, as always, until next time, ciao, homie. <laughs>